gentle viewer, I'm your host Chris. Welcome to Comic Tropes. Today I want to talk to you about the comic book The Defenders by Marvel Comics. There's a Netflix adaptation coming up, but the lineup on the Netflix adaptation with Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Iron Fist, and Luke Cage is wildly different than the source material that it's based on. We're going to take a look at the comic book, but there is one element that's the same, and that's that the Defenders wasn't really a team in the same way that, say, the Avengers or the Justice League is, or even the Fantastic Four. There's no charter, there's no organization, it's just a bunch of misfits who happen to align on a common goal. It was frequently referred to as the non-team throughout its run. So, uh, yeah, without any further ado, I found a pretty crazy three-part story. We're going to focus mostly on the first part, issue number 62 of The Defenders, by writer David Kraft and artist Sal Buscema. And every time I come across a trope, why don't I take a drink of Miller Lite? It's nobody's favorite. It's maybe a okay alternative, much like The Defenders. They're an okay alternative. Issue number 62, Membership Madness, begins with teammates Hellcat, Hulk, Valkyrie, and Nighthawk playing Frisbee. Yep, they're literally just standing around playing Frisbee. We have two of Defenders cliches right off the bat. We've got C-listers. I don't think that Hellcat or Nighthawk are making anybody's first round draft picks in the Superhero Fantasy uh, League. We've also got no mission. Uh, defenders would come together for a common purpose, but they'd also just sort of hang around sometimes, like in this instance. The original team was comprised of Doctor Strange, the Hulk, and Submariner, and none of those guys were necessarily team players, but they would unite for a common purpose, and pretty shortly after that, Silver Surfer joined, uh, and then pretty shortly after that, Namor left, and then Silver Surfer left. Uh, Doctor Strange was a bit of a mainstay. He was, if anything, the closest to a leader, but the Hulk actually lasted on the team the longest. He's the only founding member that's still with the comic by issue number 62. It is very hot here, so a nice cool beer is very refreshing. It's okay. Nighthawk is the current leader of the Defenders, and that's basically just because he has money. He has a really convoluted history, but it is interesting. Nighthawk was originally part of something called the Squadron Sinister, which was a team of four superheroes that this cosmic entity known as the Grandmaster gave superpowers to. And they were sort of analogs for DC characters. We had Hyperion was an evil Superman. We had Nighthawk was an evil Batman. Uh, they had, what else? Dr. Spectrum was sort of like Green Lantern. And I want to say Wizard was an evil Flash. Uh, of that, it got convoluted because later in Avengers comics, they went to a parallel Earth where there was a heroic version of this team called Squadron Supreme. Uh, so that's the iteration more people are familiar with is Squadron Supreme. But Nighthawk specifically was from the original main universe. He started as a villain, but he quickly changed his ways. Uh, he's just sort of a rich guy, and he invents his own serum, which makes him stronger at night, plus he has a suit with wings and a jetpack. He's... he's okay. He's fine. The team begins playing frisbee, and it seems more like it's an excuse for the characters to shout each other's names. Uh, let's see, Hellcat does some sort of weird hip-hop dance move while she throws the frisbee. Ah, uh, someone will have to explain the physics of exactly what's happening there, because I don't understand it. Nighthawk catches the frisbee, throws it to Hulk, who thinks it's stupid, and Hulk says, Here, sword girl, catch frisbee! Throws the frisbee to Valkyrie, which knocks her back and almost threw a tree. There's one of Hulk's nicknames. This was a, a pretty dumb version of the Hulk that usually appeared in the Defenders, and he would just sort of nickname everybody. Uh, Namor was Fishface or something like that, and 
Uh, Valkyrie is just Sword Girl. He makes his own names for everybody, so that's definitely a unique Defenders trope. It's also worth noting that this Frisbee must be made out of some indestructible steel because uh, Valkyrie is super strong, she gets hit with the frisbee, and instead of the frisbee just sort of, you know, breaking or bouncing off of her, it knocks her back into a tree. I know Hulk is super strong, but I don't think the frisbee should be that strong. I do think that Valkyrie is a pretty cool character, although her origin is way more convoluted than it needs to be. You can just remove huge chunks of it and, and still understand the character. The important stuff is that she's an Asgardian, like Thor, and she was tasked by Odin to bring the souls of the noble dead to uh, Valhalla, where they would rest. It's, it's basically heaven, nice heaven, instead of hell. So that was her job, and supposedly millennia ago, all of the Marvel gods, because they all exist, you've got Zeus, you've got Egyptian gods, you've got her, you know, who else? I don't know, Zeus, did I mention him? Sorry, I'm a little buzzed already. So you've got all these gods, and they all agreed to stop interfering with mortals a long time ago. Valkyrie basically didn't have much of a job after uh, the gods agreed to that, so, you know, she, uh, she just wanted something to do, so she became a superhero. That's cutting out massive parts of her origin, but I'm sure that the version in the upcoming Thor Ragnarok movie will also probably be simplified, because technically her name is Brunhilde, and she's possessed like three or four different bodies of other real people. It's so convoluted, and it just doesn't need to be. But anyway, Valkyrie's kind of cool, and she's like a big mainstay from, like, she joined the Defenders real early on, and uh, she stayed with them through the end. The Defenders Frisbee game is interrupted by a new guy called Dollar Bill. He's a guy who decided that he was going to be friends with the Defenders, he makes documentaries, and he interrupts them to tell them that he's made a documentary about them, and surprise, it's about to air on TV. Uh, they're all surprised, but Nightwing is actually angry. He says, I could sue the shirt off your back, you cinema freak, for selling that show without our authorization. Inviting yourself into our group was one thing, but this... Hellcat is excited to be on TV because she used to be a model. The Hulk doesn't care one way or the other. Valkyrie tries to calm Nighthawk down, but there's no punctuation in her word balloon that I can see, so it says, Calm down, Kyle. Angry words cannot undo the damage Dollar Bill meant well. Dollar Bill jumps in saying, Buffo, his cork's capped. Let's boogie on in. Can you tell that this issue was written in 1978? Yeah, the lingo might just give it away. Threatening that lawsuit is kind of an example of mundane problems. A lot of the Defenders would deal with mundane problems on top of their superhero stuff. Uh, just a few issues later, Nighthawk had to deal with a tax evasion lawsuit. The team sits down and watches the documentary over the next several pages, which essentially acts like a recap to get new readers up to speed on who the Defenders are and what they do. They basically just fight all sorts of weirdos, primarily supernatural threats, but really all sorts of stuff. And Dollar Bill talks about how great and amazing and powerful they are. After a bit of recap, Dollar Bill mentions their most recent adventure. He says, Anyway, the Defenders didn't stop there. Not even their Academy Award-winning performance stopped them, or me, Dollar Bill, from teaming up with Spider-Man against that crazy campus killer lunatic. Dollar Bill says that the Defenders gave Academy Award-winning performances. I think he might have meant Academy Award-worthy performances? Close enough, right? Uh, so, lunatic. Uh, by the way, it's spelled lunatic with a K in the first panel, and then in the very next panel they spell lunatic with a C. Who cares about details, right? Lunatic is an example of another trope. Lame villains. Yeah, the Defenders would go up against all sorts of nobodies, C-listers, D-listers, characters that you'd never see again. I think their weirdest lame character was this guy called Elf with a Gun. He was honestly just a guy who dressed in an elf suit who went around shooting random people. He was a murderer, kind of like the real-life Zodiac killer. It was actually kind of creepy. And guess what? The Defenders never even met him. He just got hit by a car, I think, in the end. It was a subplot in several Defenders issues, and then they never even had to face the guy. Weird. 
Dollar Bill closes out the documentary saying, Remember folks, the Defenders as a supergroup is not like the Avengers at all. The Defenders is a non-team. That means there's no charter, no rules, no nothing. Anyone with superpowers who wants to declare himself a Defender is automatically a member. It's a snap. So if any of you super sorts are out there, just zip to this address and zowie, you're in like Flint. That's right, Dollar Bill, who's not even really a member of the team, not only invited anybody to join their team, but he gave them Nighthawk's address. This guy is a dick. And Nighthawk does not take it well. He instantly starts yelling at Dollar Bill, saying, Dollar Bill's defenders? Since when, Cinema Freak? Since you appointed yourself our press agent? Your asinine documentary just made us the laughing stock of the whole world, you chucklehead! Valkyrie just goes with the flow. She says, our veil of anonymity is gone forever, but, you know, it's hardly the end of the world. That's taken things pretty darn well. Meanwhile, Hellcat likes the attention, and uh, Hulk calls her Cat Girl. Nighthawk's ranting is interrupted by constant doorbell ringing and banging on the door. He runs over to get it, and it's tons of superheroes. Hercules speaks for the group, saying, Greetings, mortal. Truly thine unorthodox appeal on the airwaves last night has borne fruit worthy of Olympus itself. I'm very confused about the timing on all of this. The Defenders were just watching the documentary, they started yelling at each other, and then it was interrupted by a doorbell, but then Hercules says he saw it last night. So, I really don't know. Did Dollar Bill air it last night and then it was aired again? I mean, maybe. Also, it's kind of weird that all of these superheroes want to just be on any old team and they all show up at the same time. So all of these superheroes seemingly reacted within the hour. Uh, these guys need something to do. But things are about to get even crazier. Nighthawk justifiably kicks Dollar Bill out of his house, but Falcon is overhead and says, Hey, what's with you, man? Leave the dude alone. And they instantly start fighting with each other. The Defenders would fight one another and other superheroes about as much as they fought supervillains. Hellcat is written fairly shallow in this issue. She looks out the window and says, Wow, I must have died and gone to hunk heaven. It's a dream come true. Which one do you want, Val? Val doesn't respond, so they eventually decided to characterize Valkyrie as a lesbian, and it really fits. Hellcat steps outside to the group of superheroes, and one guy says, I'm the Torpedo, and unfortunately, I'm married. What does Torpedo mean, unfortunately, I'm married? Like, unfortunately for himself? Unfortunately for Hellcat? Why is it unfortunate? That's, that's, that's very confusing. Captain Ultra, the guy in the super ugly costume, thinks to himself, what a dish. Hellcat says, gee, you're cute. What's your handle, Honcho? Captain Ultra's the name, Hellcat, and I'm every inch a superhero. Hellcat must have vision problems. This guy is far from cute. That is one ugly costume. And Captain Ultra is a total loser. In his first appearance, he was so afraid of fire that he fainted when he saw a lit cigarette. I'm not making that up, unfortunately. In the next panel, before the superheroes can even start a conversation with the actual defenders, Nova completely loses interest and says, Look what I see, Marvel Man. Horses. I don't know about you, but I'm gonna go play cowboy. These are some terrible superheroes. Last one there is a rotten egg. Hey, no fair, Nova, you got a head start. No matter, my compadres, the White Tiger shall triumph. Yeah, good luck with that, White Tiger. I'm sure you're going to be able to outrun the guy whose entire power is flying at a ridiculously fast speed. That, that makes a hell of a lot of sense. Black Goliath starts talking to some of the other superheroes and says, We need a real leader, someone who can handle all these superhero hotshots. Jack of Hearts agrees and tries to convince Captain Marvel to step up, but Captain Marvel says that instead, there's someone here who's been both an Avenger and Chief of the Champions, someone who is a seasoned warrior and a proven leader of men. I nominate Hercules. 
what gives these guys the right to nominate a new leader of the Defenders before they even talk to him? This would be like if a bunch of applicants were waiting in a lobby for a new job and then they just decided to unanimously elect one of themselves as new leader of the company. Also, I wish that they could have just called that guy Goliath. Why does he have to be Black Goliath? I guess because it was still the 70s. The group responds, his fabled exploits are known even in Tagak's far off land. He has Stingray's vote. Hey, if Stingray and Tagak support you, I mean, you're going all the way. Miss Marvel speaks up, saying, The Defenders is said to be utterly democratic, so all those for Hercules declare yourselves, and everybody instantly nominates him. Hercules accepts the nomination as new leader of the Defenders. Who said the Defenders are utterly democratic? Nobody. Nobody used that term. Miss Marvel just pulled that right out of her ass. And Hercules, the ego on this guy, he's like, yeah, I'm the new leader. The next several pages are literal horseplay with Nova, Prowler, Marvel Man, who went on to be Quasar, basically all just riding horses for fun while Nighthawk chases Falcon through the sky. Utterly pointless. Eventually, Nighthawk and Falcon fly close to the horses, scaring them, and they begin riding really, really fast. While all of this is happening, Valkyrie has brewed coffee for everybody, and then we have a whole page of characters like Son of Satan, Captain Marvel, Stingray, and Hercules talking about how gross her coffee is. That takes an entire page, talking about how bad the coffee is. This comic has no urgency at all to get to the plot. While that's going on, Torpedo summons Havoc, Iron Fist, Black Goliath, and Tagak, and says, Hulk is a menace. It's our duty as superheroes to capture him. These guys all saw the documentary. They know that the Hulk is a founding member of the Defenders, and now, spur of the moment, they're going to try to arrest him. This issue is insane. Before anything else can happen, we're treated to an entire page of Captain Ultra and Jack of Hearts arguing over Hellcat. Hellcat tries to calm down their jealousy, saying, Golly, don't get steamed, guys. We're here to boogie, not battle. Then Captain Ultra loses his temper and shoves Hellcat down. I bet Captain Ultra was one of those guys that supported Gamergate. They begin insulting each other. Captain Ultra shouts, Ha! You're playing with half a deck, you dope! Don't get personal, Captain Colorblind! That does it, jerk of hearts! Stop waving that fist, fella! But before the two can come to blows, the out-of-control horses stampede by, interrupting everybody. It is a little interesting seeing two guys argue over Hellcat. I'm pretty sure that the writer was very intentionally referencing Hellcat's past, because as Patsy Walker, in the 40s, she started very much like an Archie book. It was um, just a teen romance book. She'd have guys fighting over her. And then in the 60s, they revamped her to be a fashion model, and it was more of a soap opera drama. Uh, and being a fashion model and having the two most gaudily dressed superheroes there arguing over her? I don't know. I think it's all intentional. That's what I think. I choose to believe that there's some intentional humor here. Hulk wanders off by himself and thinks, Hulk doesn't like so many heroes. Hulk should smash. But Sword Girl says no. And he sits by himself and is instantly ambushed by a bunch of the superheroes. We get a to-be-continued saying, sheer hulk cost 30 years after World War II, and they felt comfortable saying hulk cost uh, Anyway, there were two more issues. Not a lot happened in those either. In the next issue, a bunch of superheroes start beating up the Hulk, and we cut to a quick subplot where Valkyrie, Hercules, and Hellcat are back at the mansion, and Iron Man flies in. He says, Sorry to interrupt your membership, Bash folks, but I've got some bad news. First, though, here's a letter for you, Hellcat. It's been lying around Avengers Mansion for quite a while. Iron Man has bad news to deliver, but he still had time to run over to the table, pick up a letter for Hellcat, and go, like, I should take this over to her. Now's a good time. And he decides to give her that letter before announcing this bad news. Iron Man explains the bad news, saying, 
Because of the Defenders TV documentary last night, Valkyrie, hordes of supervillains have declared themselves to be Defenders. Manhattan is a mess. Valkyrie announces that it's her responsibility to restore order, and Hercules just picks up a tree and knocks out all the superheroes, and apparently the Hulk, stopping that fight. All the people applying for membership on the Defenders divide into three teams. One led by Valkyrie, one led by Hercules, and one led by Nighthawk. But there's still three leftovers. Paladin, Captain Marvel, and Miss Marvel, who all declare that they no longer have any interest in joining the Defenders. Paladin says that he works for pay. So why do he even show up? Captain Marvel simply says, Captain Marvel has seen enough to know the Defenders are not for me. And Miss Marvel says, I was curious because of my previous day with the Defenders, but I have since become an Avenger. Now all of these superheroes have just heard from Iron Man that there are supervillains causing chaos in Manhattan. But these three are like, yeah, uh, Defenders, not for me. Uh, you guys can deal with that problem. Not for me. Very brave. Eventually, all of the Defenders end up in downtown Manhattan, and there's a team of supervillains working together under the leadership of... Sagittarius. Sagittarius. One of twelve in the Zodiac Cartel, and not even the guy that leads the team. This is a pretty low-level C-list villain leading other villains. This is pretty low-stakes stuff. They're robbing a bank. We've got like 20 or so superheroes to stop them. The stakes are not high, my friends. In fact, as everybody begins to fight, the police show up. Everybody stops fighting, including the villains, and the police can't tell who's a defender and who isn't, so he says, I've got news for the lot of you. You're all under arrest. And it's another to be continued. And in that third issue, basically the supervillains instantly decide to run away, so the superheroes chase them down. Uh, they eventually end up in a fight on the Staten Island Ferry. Valkyrie punches them all, heroes and villains alike, and they go flying through the sky, and they still have time to casually think about it. Nobody especially minds being punched through the air. It's pretty cartoony. Yeah, The Defenders, it's quite an entertaining title. It was uh, written by guys like Steve Englehart and Steve Gerber, who were known for their out-there stories. These guys just loved using obscure heroes and villains because nobody else was touching them. So they could do almost whatever they wanted in this book. Sometimes that meant it was a little bit aimless, but it was actually usually pretty funny. It was always a good time, and it's always just an interesting idea seeing these misfit superheroes that aren't necessarily team players being forced to work together. It always added conflict. There was natural conflict because none of these people worked well with each other. So anyway, The Defenders was a tremendously uh, entertaining comic. I recommend it no matter what the creative team, no matter what the roster of superheroes. It's always pretty entertaining and I'm excited to see what Netflix does with some of the more popular superheroes in that same sort of idea. A bunch of people that just have a similar goal but none of them are team players. Could be very entertaining. But I am sweating to death. I'm, I'm super super hot. Uh, it's over 100 degrees, I've got lights on, I can't have the air conditioning on because it messes with the audio, so I'm going to end this now. I appreciate your support. Be sure to check out my Patreon if you haven't already. Uh, and until next week, keep reading comics.